Welcome everyone on this new episode of Let's Talk AI. I'm super happy to be here today with Daniel Lenton. Daniel, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yes, beautiful sunny day in California, so I can't complain. Awesome. So um, for everyone who is not um, familiar with the podcast, we deep dive with experts in the data AI field and we try to do one hour content with them to understand them, their journey, what are they working on and uh, every interesting things for anyone interested in data AI. Okay, that being said, Daniel, for the people who might not know you, could you maybe do a few sentences introduction? Yeah, of course. Uh, so yeah, founder at Unify, um, originally did a mechanical engineering uh, degree, realized I don't like it that much. Uh, there was another version of myself that may have gone into Formula One, but I was kind of really interested in robotics. Did a PhD then in like kind of robotics, 3D vision and AI, um, and then fell in love with infrastructure um basically um and kind of started wrestling with pytorch tensorflow jacks all of these machine learning frameworks i uh, built a framework called ivy uh, that was very useful for researchers but since the llm boom over the last couple of years we've realized that a lot of the biggest problems right now are with llm deployment so the company's doubled down over the past kind of six months or so on really optimizing llm deployment making it faster cheaper and, and better quality basically and, and we do that through dynamic routing so sending the best prompt to each LLM but yeah anyway that, that's uh, a bit about me awesome I'll, I'll get I want to get more into details around all of this uh, so you kind of describe your actual mission but I don't know if you want to add a few words to like what are you currently trying to achieve so I like to talk about the state of the art of people so what's your state of the art as of today not technology but like you <laughs> What am I, well, I, I think, well, I, everybody is trying to achieve. <laughs> like your mission, like yeah, having what drives you or what, what are you super curious about? Yeah, I don't know. Well, t t what personally drives me is like doing stuff that I find interesting and like fulfilling my intellectual cur curiosity. I've never been interested in money really or, or anything like this. Like, I mean, basically when I did my pitch, when I started my PhD, I, I had offers to go work in consulting or investment banking and stuff. And like the reason I did a, wanted to go into robotics and do a PhD was because I just found it super interesting. I find the way the human brain works really interesting. I like read quite a lot of neuroscience uh, textbooks. I read quite a lot of books on evolution and things. And like the, the thing that gives my life excitement and purpose, like beyond just, you know, friends, family and everything, um, is, is when I don't understand something and I want to understand it better and I want to like uncover that intellectual curiosity and work on it and get spent all day thinking about it and building it like, I think this is uh, what, what kind of drives me. So, and obviously if you can do that and solve real problems in the process, then then that's great. But um, yeah, I guess that's kind of my main my main driving force. Awesome, thanks for sharing your state of the art. Um, okay, so can we do a, a quick throwback into uh, university? You're going for a PhD. I don't want to put words in your mouth. So maybe can you describe the key moments that you've been through and maybe some insights regarding each of those? Yeah, sure. So, so when I first, I mean, it's kind of funny. I think I didn't know what I wanted to do. I mean, going way back when I wanted to actually do more creative stuff. So I was going to, so I was in a band when I was younger. I wanted to, I did study music at high school. I wanted to do film studies, art, music, and, and maybe, well, I wasn't going to do English, but maybe maths as well. But, but I kind of really like saw music tech or like becoming a film director or something as my original like passion and, and something I'm still very passionate about, like film and everything. Um, but yeah, but then I was like, well, actually, I don't know. I, I also want to have a job kind of like, <laughs> um, so I then ended up doing like maths, physics and chemistry instead. And then got really into doing engineering, partly because of renewable energy. I wanted to design wind turbines and things. And then I really enjoyed engineering. I like the fact that combined creativity with the technical side because Obviously, engineers don't just like go down into the physics, but you build something and create something using the principles of, you know, of maths and science, which was a nice mix of like my creative expression, like wanting to express myself creatively and go into the technical. And then with engineering, I fell in love with coding through MATLAB, actually, of all languages. And I realized I really want to do coding. I really want to do robotics. Um, so then I did a, I think that was a, a pivotal moment that my first exposure to coding I then did a like internship style thing in the mechatronics department at Impro College um, with um, yeah kind of the mechatronics team, and then I worked on a project building a um, robotic controller for like a, for surgery and and building a stereo vision system to predict the depth. And then I got really into computer vision and like how the eyes perceive things. 
And then, yeah, then I did a, 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 this is a long answer, but then I did a master's project in vision as well, like tracking the arm for stroke rehabilitation. And then all of that made me want to do a PhD in, in computer vision and robotics. And, and then the PhD was then when I really learned how to code. Up until the age of 21, the best I'd done was hacked together a horrendously long Python script and didn't know anything about software engineering principles. Then I joined this lab where everybody was a much better software engineering than me. I was, I think I was you know, very lucky to, to get into that lab. Uh, it was the Dice Robotics Lab at Imperial College and, and you know, full of incredible researchers and engineers. And I learned a lot from all of them. Um, I learned a lot during my internship at Amazon. I worked on their drone program and again, was surrounded by great engineers that I you know, absorbed lots from. And then, and yeah, I, don't know, I then kind of fell in love with systems engineering, like how we can actually make the deployments faster and more efficient and fell in love with like coding in general and, and, and software engineering design. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's been like a meandering journey, like in a way. And I think that's always the best thing. Like, so just to put the, just to tie that up, <laughs> like basically all I've ever done is answered the question, what is the thing that excites me the most in the next six months? What is it that like I want to do that fulfills my intellectual curiosity? And I just do whatever that is. And that that's meant that I've gone from an engineering degree to doing robotics, to doing infrastructure, to then building this framework Ivy, to now doing LLM stuff. And there's not really like a clear thread to be built on, but like, but, but obviously what you learn in the whole process is like, you know, general problem solving skills. I think one of the most important things you can pick up in your career is like meta learning, like learning to learn new information quickly and, and technical information quickly. And, and I think that's something that I try to try to do, um, yeah, I guess that. I guess I guess I can wrap up there. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and so you're in, so you're founder of Unify. Uh, you've been YC Combinator 2023. Um, at what point did you decide to become a founder? And why yes. Unify and why is a mission? Yeah. So um, I decided to become a founder when VCs started to reach out and like suggest investing in the open source project we created. So um, the story is, um, so basically originally we open sourced a project called IV that was used by a lot of students and researchers to basically enable them to convert code between different frameworks. So there was a lot of people using TensorFlow, a lot of people using JAX and PyTorch and all this problem whereby, you know, you, you could have a project released in one, a project released in the other, and you couldn't really compare them and combine them into a single project. So I just solved that problem in the open source space. I didn't really think about building a company. I didn't know what YC was until a few weeks before applying, just because I've been quite outside of, out of the loop there. Um, and then, yeah, and then I wanted the open source project to grow. I wanted to solve this problem. Some VC started to reach out. They said, hey, maybe you should like apply for some VC funding. This seems like it could be a cool company. And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, why not? Um, then applied to YC kind of a few weeks later after learning about what it was. Um, and yeah, it, it, it wasn't really about deciding to be a founder. It was like, I want to solve this problem. I really want to keep building this. And obviously that's a lot easier if you if you have funding to do so. And then since then, I've like actually learned a lot about what it takes to be a founder. I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way. Um, and kind of, I think I'm much, I think I'm a much better founder now than I was when I started and definitely didn't really know what I was doing in the beginning. Um, but I guess nobody really does. Um, but yeah, but, but again, like my driving force isn't that I always thought I want to be a founder. It was never in my plan to be a founder. I just wanted to build cool stuff and, and solve problems that I'm excited about. And it's kind of let, let me here, basically. Ooh, awesome. Okay. So, yeah, I think there are different things. Um, but to your point, uh, yeah. Every time someone says, oh, I'm getting older when their birthday comes, I, I just like to say you're just the best version of yourself that you've ever been because you have like you've never had that much of experience and so yeah i like this idea of yeah continuous learning and just continuous exploration uh and yeah, i think yeah. that that's no it's, it's inspiring the, 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 there's someone i know that's like 80 years old that just started a math degree and like I, lo I just love the idea that like at any point in time you could be like the head of you'd have a really prestigious job and if you want to you could just go and i don't know learn to surf or you can just go and like I know that obviously people have financial obligations and get locked in, but I think it's I think it's in people's heads a little bit that you're you're so locked into where you're in in your career. Like at any point, if you want to, you can kind of you know you can follow something that you're passionate about and keep doing that throughout your career. I think so. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we'll get back on, on this topic. So, 
Um, so can you tell us more about um, the idea of for the best LLM technology and Unify? And so maybe describe a little bit how this open source project was, how did you got engagement around it? So you kind of mentioned who were using it. Um, but after that, when you started that, you wanted to do it further and full time. What, how did that look? Um, what did you start doing or maybe what were the first actions? Can you share a little bit some yeah. insights regarding that? Of course. So I was I was doing it originally to support. So this is talking about um, Ivy now. So this is actually not what we're working on as a company anymore, but just in terms of that kind of progression. It was something that I was working on in my spare time. Um, and I was doing it basically to supplement the research I was doing. So I was doing robotics research and computer vision research. And I found it annoying dealing with a few different frameworks. So I it was kind of a passion project I did on the side. And I developed it alongside the research to try to give me the tools that I needed um and then at some point I just kind of got consumed by it I really enjoyed building it I could tell that it could be very useful if other people used it and it was something that no one was addressing there was not a single solution to this exact problem out there and and I, I got I think captivated just by how big of a problem it could solve if somebody builds it right and I've like made a start building it and it just needs more time more engineers they need to like put more resources into it and I just kind of, yeah, became, it just became like a passion project. And I was spending more and more of my time building that instead of doing kind of you know, research. And then, and yeah, it only then became a full-time thing once we got the first ticket. Actually, it wasn't YC that, that invested first. We, we um, so yeah, got, got a, a pre-seed investment of like just 200K and they would me to hire some interns. Um, and again, like the, the idea was kind of, not we need to now go raise a big seed we need to now go raise loads of money i was like we've got 200k that'll see us through for a few years like let's build the project out and see where it goes uh, but then things just start to snowball and we got like a lot more open source traction which enabled us to get more funding and hire more people and kind of and build out from there and we basically continue to raise incrementally um from that point forward basically but but yeah i mean but it basically was the finance like it was the investment that obviously enabled me to do it full time because up to that point I, I was, I kind of um, was just doing it independently. Didn't really have a clear income stream. I had a bit of savings from like, I don't know. I was, I was a bartender for like 10 years <laughs> and I mean like part-time, but I, so I had a bit of savings, but I was kind of like running out of personal money to like fund anything um, basically. And, and so, yeah, I was able to like properly, uh, properly do it when we got the, the, the investment and, and obviously we're doing a full time ever since. Yeah. I think I'll be able to ask you about productivity. That can be fun. Because uh, it seems like you're you keep yourself busy, but I guess this is what curiosity looks like. Just following curiosity in yeah, you don't. You, but uh, I'll get back on curiosity on no on productivity. Sorry. So you've done the YC program. So YC wasn't your first investor, but in what way during the program served you? Uh, in your direction and the growth of the company. Yeah, so I think I think with YC, the biggest thing for me as a first time founder was actually actually just some of the basics. Um, some of the basics that you can even get from startup school. Obviously, then what you get is much more granular, nuanced advice. It's very particular to your setup, which can only happen when your partner understands the nuances of your company and everything. So. There is definitely more that you get from doing the program than just what you can ingest from startup school, for example. Um, but that's been one of the biggest, most valuable points. I mean, there's some things that I think instinctively a lot of founders make mistakes on, and I'm certainly no exception. We overhired quite early on without having really validated that we had true product market fit. We were talking to customers, but like not enough. Like the really obvious things, always talk to our customers, become obsessed with the problems, don't become obsessed with your solution there's this thing like solution in search of, search of a problem that's like a really common pitfall founders fall into and i think i did there as well a bit um so so just yeah I, I, I just like undoing a lot of the instincts the founders come into holding and and trying to unlearn those is is it requires you to like really uh, reframe the re, reframe things and i think trusting that there's they've seen enough companies and to to enough companies to like find some really strong rules of thumb that like on average are, are the right things to focus on and and, it, and it's been very very useful for us basically the other thing obviously is the 
the founder network. I mean, I'm in these Slack groups, the number of YC founders that I regularly meet for coffee and up on a call with, and many of our early users are YC founders. So I've been able to like sell to YC companies. And, and obviously if you build a great product, you can do that anyway, but just having that network is also very useful. And the branding, like we raised a lot, quite a lot of funds after YC. And I think the whole kind of YC batch demo day rush, like deadline, I think probably helped with our fundraise as well a bit. Um, so there's lots of benefits, but it's definitely it's something I was a bit skeptical on because it's a lot of equity that you give. But I, but certainly in retrospect, it's been a very good decision for us for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for the details. Um, that makes a lot of echoes to to different things that uh, I've been listening. And uh, yeah, the YC label and the and the network is one of the, is our two things of like the uh, what I've been hearing about. It really seems that whatever you're doing when you go into that route, you have access to like um, very talented people that can just give you some great tips, etc. Um, awesome. So before starting about building and leadership, I'd like to comment a little bit on productivity. So. You've been doing a lot of things. You were very interested at the beginning in music, cinema, etc., uh, and you like to play around with things and build and follow your curiosity. Um, how do you organize yourself? Or do you have tips maybe for um, managing your time and your productivity to find balance and, and maximize uh, your curiosity? Yeah, that's a, that's a yeah, great question. I, I certainly don't think I have all the answers here. I, I'm always trying to be more productive, and and I think I certainly could be more productive. Um, but I I think one thing that definitely has helped me is like keeping a track of what I do every day. So I have a log where at the end of every day I kind of say what I worked on and like you know the things I've got achieved and everything. But everyone on the team gives a, a daily log and like then being able to like retrospectively go back and see where you're wasting time see where you could be improving things is always important i think one thing as well like this is not some it's not so much about personal productivity which i can come back to but also just making sure that you delegate things as quickly as you can like i want to make sure that now um i want to make sure that i'm only spending time doing things that kind of i need to be doing like so anything that's repetitive or tedious or just like simple things like if I keep getting an email from a certain email address that I, you know, might want to read later, but don't need it in my inbox, then adding a filter to automatically bypass your inbox or whatever, or like doing things regularly that like take a, few, a bit of time, but in the long run, save you time is something that's obviously a good thing to do. Um, but I think, I, I think, I think actually the most important thing, the most important thing actually that should be top of the list is being productive doesn't mean doing more hours. It means like, working smart instead of working hard as well so like i think this is kind of where it comes back to as well if you want to build a startup and everything like you could spend 10 hours a day like being feeling super productive building this really complex system and like feeling really energized and getting out of bed early every morning and but the but if the energy is not actually the right thing to be doing then it's it's even you know it's even worse so i think this is where like constantly talking to your customers and doing things that aren't as fun like i mean i do like talking to customers but like I would much rather just get into building a really complex engineering system and like just kind of fall in love with my vision of the company and like, but like that isn't good use of time. Like you can massively over engineer things. Like the amount of stuff that people build that nobody uses is, is tragic. Like, so, so I think kind of the most important thing is to just follow the basics and just be very rigorous with it. Like, you know, do do what is the tried and tested way to be successful with building a company talk to the talk to your customers regularly make sure that everything you're building is motivated by exactly why you're building it and then you don't even need to work crazy hours like if you're doing intelligent things and minimizing the time you waste on things that aren't actually the right thing then that's the most the best way of being productive obviously um but in terms of like i don't know just like getting out you know getting out better in the morning and putting in the hours and everything and staying energized um i'm not sure i have any and any any tips as such um i just make sure everything i ever have to do is on a to-do list i never forget a task because i just have this like super simple trello board which is every item i need to do what i tend to do is on days where i have lots and lots of meetings i do the really low hanging fruit because i have 30 minutes here 20 minutes here so i you know reply to emails do the stuff that's like really easy to get done that just makes the list feel less overwhelming because like 
the number of items on the list like reduces by 70 percent and then on the weekends i typically do the deep work where any given task might take six or seven hours of continuous like deep thought work so you seem to be a bit sensible at when you try to take on certain tasks and everything obviously with your calendar scheduling but anyway that's a few different points i touched on hopefully some of that was <laughs> somewhat useful but yeah i'm sure it was and uh I really like how from different pieces of content on productivity and on being a founder and on having a vision, like for example, YC Combinator, um, they have a lot of videos where they explain you like the best practices and so on. And it really seems to me that it's like everything in life. It's not like on or off. It's just like gradually the percentage of me doing it or not and tracking it and being consistent. Um, can you spoke regarding consistency? And like, because you've been building for so much time. And so maybe there are those days that you feel like nothing is working. And those days where you feel you have a lot of dopamine because things like the needle is, yeah. you can see the needle moving. Yeah. You can say that. So yeah, 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 yeah. Comment on that. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I've definitely had periods where it has been hard to stay motivated, actually. So after the pivot away from Ivy, I was definitely not as motivated. And there's the kind of, you know, the whole existential dread a little bit can creep in. And I think like there's a few things, slightly related to what you're saying, but one thing that's very important is that your identity can't be too tied to the company. Like, like I, I'm doing everything in my power to make sure the company succeeds and feel particularly now after the launch feeling very excited about the way things are going and you always need to like be really putting the work in and like you know and you do need to be kind of sweating a bit when if things aren't going well because you need the adrenaline to like kick you into gear a bit but you, everything's within reason like you can't get to the point where the success or failure of the company is everything and like you need to be able to pl unplug from it and i certainly have time in the week on every sunday where i don't think about the company well i think about it but like i don't work I, I fully unplug i do stuff that's totally unrelated you need to make sure you keep that balance um is one way to it's just necessary obviously to be able to just like manage the stresses of doing a company that it's like not everything for you obviously um and oh, oh well, what else was gonna say now um yeah and 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 i guess i don't know i think for me even if things aren't going well the, the, i always know what needs to be done right as long as as long as you understand where the problems are there's always well what do we try next what do we try next and and i just knowing that it's normal like there's the whole like graph that's like the the, the i don't know what it's called but like this kind of you know peak of like hype where you release it's launch day everybody checks out the website people tweet about it talk about it and then it totally drops off because you know you're not the hot day the the, the hot news of the day anymore like there's another hot thing that came up the next day and whatever and then you you know it drops down and then you maybe slowly get gradual usage and i think expectation management is something that a lot of people may, maybe don't have like if you get one user that's great that's something to celebrate if you get two users that's great celebrate it like onboard them personally get them that's that's progress then you get your first 10 users and yeah that's also great you're not a billion dollar company yet that's fine like the beginning it's just it is just the way startups work like they take a ton of work at the beginning it's incredibly manual you've got to be really white glove really close with your first users and then iterate with them and make sure you're building something useful. And I think as long as you have a playbook that you believe in and that you know if you keep executing through this playbook, you're going to continue to turn the gears so you get in the right direction, then your sense of motivation isn't driven by how successful you apparently are in that moment. It's driven by, if I keep doing this, things will continue to get better, we'll make some more improvements, and then it will start to pick up and like, I don't know. So, so I think my, my motivation is pretty decoupled from like how many customers we have and how much traffic we have or how much we've raised. It's kind of driven by what do we need to do to make this better if we're going to provide value and like what is the next step and what's the next step and what's the next step. And, and I think you need to think that way, basically. I think so, yeah. I think so. You've got to be grounded in like the vision of where it's going to go if things pick up, but like you, you've got to be very patient and you just got to like, you got to trust the process. You got to just trust it. You keep doing it. You keep doing it. You keep doing it. Incremental things one at a time, things will start to fall into place um, if you're, you know, persistent enough, basically. Awesome. There are two things that uh, 
seems relevant that I would like to ask you about. Uh, on one side, we have, so you 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 will choose which way we go. This is a, a two part. <laughs> on the side, we have uh, building a team and building engineering to add value, and on the other side, talking to customers and like this art of understanding problems and like communication through what are your pains? How do I solve them in the most efficient way? Yeah. So which route do you want? And you can, you can do both. Or maybe, and then maybe the one after. Yeah. Well, maybe customers actually, because that's something that I've been learning more about recently. I think what a lot of people probably do wrong is go into sales mode a bit too quickly. Um, I, on the first call, literally just want to understand the problem because I want to like have an internal mental model that is accurate about what people's problems are. So like, and also like, I mean, there's some cases where somebody wants to use our platform and I don't think it's going to solve their problem. And I, and I kind of tell them that <laughs> like, well, actually this isn't really like, you know, designed for you because of this and like what you probably need to do is this. And like, I think kind of what you want to do is not just like try to get everybody to use your platform what you want to do is like build and maintain a really deep intuition and understanding about what the real problems are build a solution that actually addresses that and then it will sell itself anyway and that's the hard thing to do like like you could probably get a few sales over the line by like aggressive selling something that someone doesn't need but like that's not going to build into a scalable business like so you know how useful is it to hard sell it to five people to get five customers that aren't really needing your solution anyway. Like it's, it's, it's going to give you some like fake product market fit that then isn't going to scale when you really need it to. So uh, my main thing of talking to customers is first of all, I, well, in my approach, again, I'm not saying I have it in the best way, but it's all founder driven. So I do like six or seven sales calls a day. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm currently, let's say personally managing like, you know, a hundred relationships or something at the moment. And I think that's, good and and you do as a founder because if you're the if you're the founder and or the ceo you're the one that's broadly steering the product direction and unless you have a deep deep understanding of the problem then you're not going to be able to prioritize things correctly at all so i actually think it's necessary both from kind of a white glove relationship building approach to get your first customers but also to make sure that your priorities are aligned correctly because you're only building for your users. You're not building because of your vision of, you know, what the system should look like or whatever. Um, so yeah, so, so that's what I would say. And I would say, you know, only go into sales mode if you are confident that they have a problem that actually your stuff can solve. And if it can't, don't try and sell it, ask them more questions, understand the problem they have. And this isn't, and don't ask, sorry, the last thing I know I'm doing the long answers, but don't say, Hey, does this solution solve your problem problem it's like why is this a problem like is this a problem because of this and what's another really annoying thing about that and why and like what and, and how do you then go about that right now and and like we, we always ask you know why why is it really hard to get it work what test set do you have and like how do you do your system how do you do your reprompting okay and like how, it might have nothing to do with what we're building but we still double down to just understand that the granular detail because obviously it could come on the roadmap there could be some relevance and and, and we might need to like you know expand what we're doing to address and a really broad problem we find across the market so yeah i guess the tldr is like um user discovery ask questions understand the problem build an intuition and only enter sales mode if you actually have something that you can sell to them that actually solves a problem this is kind of how i go about it right makes sense so i think i have a follow-up question on that uh so i like the idea of diving deep on the problems because maybe some some clients or users or customers are calling problems, things that are not. It seems that there is so much value into understanding an industry and then recognizing patterns because you do so many reps in these kind of calls. Do you have any way that you approach in particular this knowledge management, let's say, of each call that you run and each things that you know? How do you make sure that you'll be able to keep track of the patterns? I know that this is a messy art and that this is more like something we are like we are neural networks and we can see patterns, but do you have something that you can share here? 
it, it's it's very hard. This is what takes a lot of my time, and this is actually the big task I'm working on right now. And this weekend, I'm going to be doing that because we now have. I mean, so one thing we we do use an AI note taker, so we use Firefly, so every sales call is uh, logged, um, and we can then like in the Fireflies app, like you know, just do a keyword and search across all the calls and stuff. So there is like, and then we can like retrieve the timestamp when something was said and whatever. So like, so that that that's definitely helping. And I do think a note taker app is kind of essential um, nowadays for sure. I think it's need, needed. Um, but then when it comes to like the bigger picture, it's very hard. I mean, basically, obviously we are neural networks and I have a hazy intuition that gets built, but, but then you still need to communicate this to your team and also yourself. Like you need to know, okay, like right now, like we have a lot of people that need this to be deployed on-prem, like at least 10 companies, but I don't know off the top of my head which exact 10 companies this is. And it's also not like I just type on-prem into Fireflies and they all appear. Like the exact moment it came in the conversation, the nuances of why it needs to go on-prem, what cloud it needs to be, what aspects need to go on-prem, it's all hazily like hidden within, you know, the, the conversation history. And we're, we're at a point where overly getting like a questionnaire to fill in would be overly bureaucratic because we're just having these broad open conversations. So it's not easy. We're looking at tools for doing this, but I, I've come to the conclusion that I think I just need to put the work in. Like it's, it's it actually, this is the kind of thing that is very labor intensive that has the benefit that it will populate my own neural network deeper for me to literally go through these sales calls, read the note summaries. I don't listen to the whole thing again. There'd be like, you know, 50 hours of calls or something like this. I can't like spend the whole week, like, you know, a whole week re-listening to every conversation I've had, but I look at the note summaries. I kind of try to classify them into boxes do it in a very manual way because also that's like a very good way of me um of me like keeping it actually fresh in my own mind as well which it needs to be and the other thing i would just say is so it's basically no magic solutions i think it's just very manual for now and at some point obviously maybe there's gonna be tools that can make this a bit more systematized um particularly particularly when you're still like in user discovery phase where you're not exactly sure like once you have a, such a clear market and a clear vertical and this is the product then probably you can like template the questions and like during the call you like know what are the 10 variables you might want to track and it's easy then but when it's open-ended it's a lot harder um and the, the other motivation for doing this is so that your engineers can be motivated like when we when whenever we say this is the we have a sprint every week this is the weekly sprint whenever we have that i want every single feature request to be like linked with the exact customers that this is going to unlock value for and why it is so that everybody knows why we're building what we're building. And that keeps the engine, it make, means the engineers know why they're doing what they're doing. It's not just because it's some random thing. It's like, no, when I ship this feature, it's going to be used by these people. And that helps motivation and everyone have alignment. And also we can then collectively prioritize things in a much more mutually informed way with our small team. Um, so this is another reason why I think it's essential to do that. Um, yeah, not easy and it's time consuming, but I guess just the work needs to be put in. So. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so I think you, you've kind of, uh, went, I think we'll do the second pass either way, because if not, I would be frustrated. <laughs> um, so building a great team, building a great product. So there is this trade-off between when you capture value, you, you might want to sell, but in reality, you might want to validate a few more hypotheses before you go in sales mode. And this is what you just said. And so related to that, how do you make sure that your product is great or that you unlock when you take the features decisions or like the next iterations of your project because you have um, limited resources? How do you make sure that you go in the right direction? And I don't know how this detail was in my head that just says you don't <laughs> just figure it out. But um, but yeah, have some some tips or sharings around building a great team. Like what what do you offer to the team? What's valuable? How do you make sure that you work on the best features? Some of this we kind of discuss. Yeah. but I'm sure you have follow ups sure. about that. Sure. Yeah. Well, I guess on the team thing, I, I mean, we, we, our situation has been quite unique because we basically. Well, we had quite a large team when we were working on IV. We, we deliberately then downsized the team, which obviously was, you know, quite difficult to do. But I've I've gone and tried to make sure everyone um, has been, you know, very much made introductions to other founders and stuff, and and um, got them all onto great uh, next roles. Um, but we so we ended up basically, I would say, like the team now 
are all incredibly independent and just you know top top engineers and, and the way so yeah the way that we went about hiring in general and everyone that's ever worked with us has been that way and i think my my first point is that i've realized that basically you don't need to go to a top university be, to be a top engineer so um we hired all over the world we had like fifty thousand people apply to our roles we had um like one and a half thousand people make uh, pull requests um basically um as part of the application process and um and with them we probably interviewed like i don't know 150 200 people or something um and yeah really uniformly spread over the world and we had people that we rejected that were like you know from stanford and mit we had people that were then, then accepted from you know from some relatively unheard of university you know somewhere else in the world um so that's the first thing i'd say is like i think you should really trust your process and trust what they can do in your own pipeline and, and don't just take their CP at face value is the way to get the best the best engineers I think um, that's one thing and then I think just in terms of like what you should do as a as a founder I guess is like I think you need to give people a lot of ownership I, I think that not that I see how it works in other places but I know from having worked in some you know my own work experience I I think a bit of a risk sometimes is over micromanagement I think you really need to like enable people to make mistakes like even if there's something that you can do faster obviously the quicker that you give someone full ownership of that you get them to do it you give them some feedback maybe it maybe something goes wrong maybe something even goes wrong in production or something but like people need to be given that responsibility at some point and the sooner they get it the sooner they can like learn from it and build upon it and and fill the ownership so that's one thing i would just say like is i you know don't de delegate effectively and give people trust um another thing is like i think we have a pretty good kind of community a, a pretty kind of democratic approach where like every direction in the company is openly discussed as a team like should we be focusing on this what are we doing wrong how can we improve should we like change the way we prioritize tasks like what could we do better and everyone has a say in that and you know no no idea is a silly idea so i think that's also necessary because then the everyone on the team you want everybody to feel like the company's you know that they they have ownership of the company in its direction and everyone's kind of on the same ship steering it together um, so these are some things I would say on the features thing again like it's literally just which we weren't doing before like before with Ivy it was much more kind of like grand vision this is like what the future's gonna look like and, and it was we then did you know get, get a lot of usage and, and, and still do I mean Ivy's still being developed and it's still used a lot um, but it was a little bit more like this is the way the future like will look like and this is the problem we're solving and let's just get the problem solved do the engineering and then like once we've done it the users and the customers will come like a bit more i mean it's not quite that black and white like we were still talking to people but but now it's like now the way we're doing things unify is very extreme where it's like we talk to people all the time i spend a huge chunk of my time talking to people and every single thing we build is motivated by motivated directly by somebody that asked for it like and this is kind of as simple as that and like then the question is there's too many things to build right now if we build everything that everyone's asked for we'll be building for many months so then it's a question of like well, which is the biggest unlock of value? Maybe which is the biggest client? Which is the one that's going to give us the most traffic? Which is the one that's most universal? So if there's something that one company's asked for and one that 10 have asked for, then you know the one that 10 have asked for probably is more of a universal feature that's fundamentally going to make the product better. So, and, and we try to not second guess on anything. Like it's a pretty extreme approach, but I think you then can't make a mistake. And, and the other thing I would say, sorry, is it's not about a feature request so much. It's more that it's like, this is a problem again, like because you, you you shouldn't really go into these user user discovery calls saying, "Hey, what feature would you like?" It's like, what is the problem? And you know, the problem that we hear a lot, for example, is, "Well, I can't send my prompts. The prompts can't leave the DPC." You know, and then the, the solution is, "Well, we need non-prem offering." So let's like put that next on the list or, or whatever. So yeah, um, I, that was a slightly meandering meandering answer, but yeah, hopefully there was some <laughs> something to extract from that. <laughs> I I had a lot of value from it. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so I think I'd like to take the bigger picture. Uh, so what do I mean by that? There is too much happening in the AI space. Papers are rainy. <laughs> this is too hard. I don't know. Uh, I'm taking a speed reading course right now <laughs> just because I want, to, <laughs> I want to keep up. So because everything is like, there are amazing announcements and amazing things unlocking. 
how does that impact you and how attentive are you uh, about the latest news? And do you feel that you could be disrupted by the next big wow in any way? Which is something I'm not sure exactly because it really seems that you're more on the infrastructure layer and you're model agnostic, so you work with everything. So the best big thing, you just integrate it. But yeah, do you have some sense of what, what others are doing and how do you react to it being in the data AI space? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think you got to get a balance because um, you also don't want to spend all of your time like consumed by social media and just like, I mean, I think there's people that go too far where they're only consuming the latest news all the time and not spending enough time just building in a way. Like, I think one thing that's worth bearing in mind is that there is a disconnect between the latest, hottest papers and the problems that enterprises have today. You know, I mean, in a way, like a lot of our customers, like, I mean, particularly when it comes to big enterprises, they're just still trying to get their data cleaned to build their first ever rag pipeline that's based on technology that could be two years old now. So... I guess like you want to be on the cutting edge, but like the latest hottest papers and the latest Neurops papers is like a, a, a different thing than the problems to solve for customers. And thankfully the problem to solve customers moves more slowly, somewhat. So like, I think I think that's one thing to just point out and just constantly reading the latest papers and constantly changing your idea because, oh, this thing's come out, this thing's come out. We need, like that's not good either. You need to be like doing coding, not stressing too much about all the noise and just solving whatever problems people have and, and just saying laser focus on that. That's one thing. But of course, you do need to rem remain aware of the, you know, the really important stuff, new models coming out so you can get it integrated quickly and just the general trends so that like you can have some sense of, am I building something that's in a growing market that's going to become bigger as time goes on? And like, am I, am I maximizing my chances for this? Because you, you want to solve customer problems today, but ideally you want to solve customer problems today that are in a growing market that's going to remain re relevant for years to come. And it's going to mean you can ride this wave to become, you know, a, huge, a big company. Um, and I think, yeah, like in fairness, I think with us, um, definitely we're impacted by, by news. Every time it, every time a new release is made, it, it materially impacts our thinking. One of the things that is quite clear to us is that routing is very useful today, but I think our platform needs to offer more than than just routing and benchmarking and actually tools to enable evaluation and um, to make it a lot easier to do prompt um, engineering, on particularly on the intermediate prompts of these big agentic systems where um, unit testing them and evaluating them and improving them is incredibly complicated to do. And this is a very common um, problem we, we hear. And just maintaining the performance, maintaining the quality and reducing... Um, the the cost and improving the speed is valuable, but I, I think that that may become less valuable over time as the models continue to get faster and cheaper. So like I think our router right now is providing a lot of value, but we need to keep iterating as a company to provide new levels of value and new like you know it, um, new new um, features um, continually. So um, to, to remain relevant and everything. So yeah, I think, but I also think you, you can't project too far ahead because to be honest, if AGI behind an API appears in three years, then I mean, it, al almost no company could provide any value. Like, <laughs> I mean, then we're all just, then we're all just going to like be, you know, writing poetry and doing paintings and listening to music and letting all the AGIs run everything. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what kind of company looks like in that world. So uh, you can't think too far ahead, let's say. You gotta also be quite grounded in the problems people have today. And yeah. yeah. I'm not a big believer around AGI be behind an API. But uh I'm curious to be wrong and to see what does that like what what does it look like it looks I, like. I, I personally think it will come. I don't know when, but like, I, I my guess would be in the next decade, let's say in the next ten years, you can basically hire a remote worker in the same way that you would through Upwork or something. Mm -hmm. They have an avatar. You, they have an email address. They have a WhatsApp. They have everything. I mean, there's, there's people on on our team that I hadn't met for the first year of them working at the company. And obviously, my mental model of them is, a, you know, is just pixels and, and text, and that's it. And at some point, we'll get to the point where you can hire AI to do the same thing. I, I think and be pretty good generalist capabilities. And and yeah, I, I actually think it'll be quicker in ten years. And I think in that world, if they're really that good, then 
and, and particularly then if robotics takes off as well and like humanoid robotics gets very good again i, I honestly would probably say i think it's more likely that in the less likely that in my lifetime the vast vast majority of jobs can be automated and then and that in that world you're really just trying to build value for like the next few years until whatever happens because at some point then every company you could possibly conceive is is not gonna like work in this capitalist you know in a capitalist setup is going to need to just be like doing good or creative or other anyway sorry getting a bit philosophical but this was uh, kind of related to my (laughs) to my next question and so maybe we want to deep dive a little bit so i think yeah i have one more question before doing my closing round but i have two parts to it so uh you mentioned it robotic so because you have this strong academic background um i would like to know like, what are you expecting from the next 10 years? Which is kind of what you described, but like looking at robotic and looking at all these advancements, uh, do you have some insights? But because you kind of went on this road, maybe you'll be able to add a few things. I'm super curious about agentic applications. Do you see use cases working in production? I know that there is this use case that is, to me, so easy to sell, which is, the voice thing where you can just interact with it if you have a good cost around that this will to me this will be a huge unlock and a lot of people will be competing for that but do you have some insights regarding robotics or agentic things yeah i i um so yeah two, two separate things i think i think on the agentic side um again like for anyone listening, obviously, agentic basically meaning chaining LLMs together so that you have like um, multiple steps of LLM calls to do high level tasks, basically. So agents mean, you know, agents used to be used in reinforcement learning and actually did mean like the agent acting in the world, but in LLMs, it's much more just like chaining LLMs together to do like multi step reasoning. Um, so, in that sense, I think agents, LLM agents, will basically, um, it's interesting because it's not the, it's not. The most efficient way of doing things like the way that um computer vision used to be is it was very hand engineered and very brittle you used to have to like hand tune your own filters you would like design the filter that you would convolve over your image to like detect um edges and detect corners and you have like dilation and all these morpholo- morpho- what's the word morphology operations basically morphological operations um, anyway, so like it used to be very, very hand engineered, very brittle, and you couldn't do that much with images. And then you could like end to end learn all these filters that you couldn't hand engineer with human heuristics, and it was way better. And now, and same with robotics, robotics used to be very system. It used to be like you first have your vision phase, and then you do a 3D map of the world, and then you look at Newtonian physics and plan how it should move and whatever. And it's like A, B, C, D, E. And if you have any noise or errors in one, they're going to propagate to the future steps. And now what works way better is end-to-end systems that have shortcuts that can bypass things. There's a really nice example that Sergey Levin, a top roboticist, would give, which is like the way that we catch a ball is not that we predict the 3D coordinate of the ball in 3D space, and then we kind of like do some motion planning to move at the right velocity and the speed. Pretty much all you do is like, you you you're, you're you basically like move at the speed that means that the ball stays in the same position in your eye line and it's as simple as that and it's like this really quick feedback loop to make sure that the ball just stays there you move at the speed that keeps it the same and then you catch it or something the point being that when you have systems that are way less heavily modular and hey like very like systematized then you have things much more end-to-end where data can pass more freely you unlock a lot more shortcuts and a lot more value and I think agent systems today, where we effectively have these nodes with English language as the only communication in a very sparse, brittle data bus, is not like the best way of doing things. It's not how our brain works. And we do high level planning and reasoning. And we don't do it by having like 30 different like little compartments just shooting these little messages to each other. It's like a much richer, like high dimensional expressive, um, you know, latent vectors that are moving around, let's say. So my point is that I think with open source models, agents should become more end-to-end trained and we should have like internal recurrence and internal planning and stuff that's not based on packing these nodes together. That's my thought on agents. But having said that, obviously human society and officers do do collective behavior from very sparse communication. So as a society, we do manage to do very complex things where all of us are only communicating with, with language. So there's definitely a place for it, but it's certainly not necessary long-term 
to like have an email agent that could understand your inbox and to have like 50 LLM calls communicating with each other. Like that should all just be end to end done, like with a much more expressive thing. That's my thought of agents. In robotics, yeah, I think um, in robotics, I think that uh, we will get humanoid robotics. The progress seems to be very good. Um, and and I think it's only a matter of time until we have robots that, yeah, I mean, can just physically do what humans can do. Like, I think it's not going to be that long. The progress over the last 10 years, for example, has been huge and it's only going to get faster. Um, and I think when we have that and we have like some pretty general ability of LLMs, like I honestly think, you know, like a household assistant robot that you talk with and it can help tidy up and stuff like is... I, I would I would I would imagine that in like ten years time a household robot that's pretty general purpose will be like a luxury item, like is my guess. And then maybe in twenty years time it'll be like a commodity. Um this is probably my guess. Yeah. But it's still gonna happen immediately, but I but I really do think that we're getting humanoid robots and we're getting some like pretty general intelligence as well. Um I feel like it's they're back. I also could be wrong because obviously GPT-40, we have hit a bit of a ceiling clearly with what pure LMs can do because GPT-4 was way ahead of the race, was way better than everything before. Now we've got um, Gemini that's pretty competitive, Claw that's pretty competitive, and they've all seemed to hit a bit of a ceiling. Let's see what GPT-5 GPT does, but GPT-40 has not been that impressive in terms of its general reasoning ability. Um, so I don't know what we should what we should read into that. Um, but if we have hit a ceiling because of the limits of data, then, um, but my feeling is, sorry, I, I'm answering lots of questions and I'll, I'll stop in a second, but my feeling is that, <laughs> my feeling is that as it's always been the case, um, compute is going to be the biggest unlocker because there's lots of things we still can't do on the compute side. Like, obviously, like we didn't need a big data set of the internet to create humanity. We needed evolution. We needed like a huge amount of data and a lot of time. And there's all kinds of other ways you could try to train these models and stuff. And if if we had like an, you know, 10 orders of magnitude, like if we had massive orders of magnitude more compute, there's way more experiments we can run and try, like how else can we get emergent intelligence to appear? And I think um, as has always been the case, the biggest unlocks for AI has been data and compute. Like the idea of neural networks stems to the 1980s, if not earlier, um, and hasn't changed all that much. It's gradient descent with backpropagation and like a transformer that's, you know, the dot two dissimilar just from a simple neural network. So like the ideas haven't changed. Like what's changed is the compute and the and the data. So I think um we're just gonna be bound by the progress we can make with NVIDIA and all the, you know, hardware. And that, that moves relatively slowly, which is why I don't think we're like right there. But I think in 10, 20 years, if like hardware continues to progress as it has done in general, then and you know, maybe some really interesting bio inspired hardware that's way more computation efficient. There's all kinds of interesting innovation with with um yeah bio inspired hard, hardware and stuff so um yeah anyway I, th I think I think I think humanoid AGI is coming in our lifetimes is my bet but let's see it's mine too because I want to see it <laughs> I want to see yeah, it. yeah so do I <laughs> I want to jump in a way more yeah, jar soon uh, that's something that I want to experience uh, and to your point I think I might want to to add one more thing and do this closing round of um digital questions that I have for you um but it's it really seems to me that if we're reaching um, a plateau, if I can th say this with my very French accent, I, I really see that we might use all this technology to gather more data at scale, like deploy things that will just go very deep into getting data correctly, directly, and just, just help with data because I don't know how far we can go with synthetic data uh, or the augmentation techniques, it seems that we can go really far and it seems that the more power we put to these things, I mean, I don't know, I have no ideas, uh, but but I don't know, I'm curious and uh, I'll definitely keep uh, an eye out regarding, I don't know if you want to add something to that. Yeah, I, I guess, um, so there's lots of interesting things. Yeah, I mean, basically one of them is, of course, if we can do federated learning securely, then that's a huge source of data. Let's say that it becomes very complicated, obviously, like, and it becomes very morally questionable or, or it, like, I'm not sure how okay people would be with this, but let's say like, let's say that every WhatsApp conversation ever had and every Facebook conversation ever had, like, that's a huge amount of data. The vast, vast majority of data on the web is the dark web. The dark web, not meaning like, you know, 
sketchy sites, the, the dark web meaning web that's not publicly available. So if suddenly we can move away from the front facing web, the public web and get more of like the dark web, let's say that's gated behind whatever it might be gated behind. And we could do that in a way that preserves privacy in, in a federated learning manner or something and train a model. Like, yeah, I, I guess like we could like at the very least like 10x the amount of internet data, maybe 100x the amount of data. And that's going to do one thing. But more interestingly, because that's still only one or two orders of magnitude that I guess isn't going to suddenly like massively change things. Um, but I think like um, what's more interesting is that AI models clearly have much better discriminate like discrimination ability than generation ability, same as people. So like it's a lot easier for a model like say which poem is better out of a and b than it is to like write a perfect poem or something same with like english uh, graders and, and teaching and stuff so my point is i think if we manage to do more research on using the the discriminative ability of ai models to then train better generators um then we can actually maybe generate more synthetic data that can be used to improve the model so let's say the model can't generate the content yet but it can train it can give a training signal so the model can kind of self-distill better generation abilities by using its discrimination ability to kind of know what good and bad looks like and then self-learn. It's almost like you imagine yourself creating things, saying this was good, actually, this was better, this was worse. Let's actually let them get better at doing this and kind of self-regulate. So I, th I think there's ways that the generation ability of models can improve, even just through generation of synthetic data internally. It's almost like distilling new capabilities in the model through other things it's good at. Um, so I don't know how far, how far that can take things, um, probably quite far. So yeah, I think there's still a lot that we can do to make things much better than the super simple ultra aggressive next token prediction that we're doing in the moment as the base for training these models. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like regulation and ethics will play a big role into what we unlock because if it was ethical, we could just like put a chip inside when we, when, like when we, when we are born to when we die and we have lifetimes of value of like dopamines of like how we feel emotions key moments on your life and you could but that would be i mean that's a black mirror episode but that's also like because if you think of like very positive use cases like in education for example you could have a unique coach and mentor that drives you and helps you achieving the best version of yourself whatever you define that for you so and you could have like the best minds that just helps you because you have thousands of years of study and that that, that just can help you go in the right direction. So that's a very sci-fi uh, <laughs> sci-fi vision, but um, but that's super curious. Okay, I don't want to. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, uh, we've been a little bit um on, but um, two last question. And first of all, thank you very much for coming on the show. I had an amazing time. If you're still listening to us, please feel free to subscribe on the channel. Let us a comment. We'll answer it. Um, where can people find more about yourself and the company? Um, so and the more applications. About, Sorry. Well, more yeah. about, yeah, 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 sure, sure. So more, well, more about the company is, is unify.ai. So just as simple as that, unify.ai. Um, I'd obviously recommend the first thing to do if you want to play around and you're interested, just the sign sign in button up on the top right, and you can kind of get started with uh, $10 of free credits, $50 if you request an extra uh, extra extension, um, and you can start playing with all the LLMs, all the models and everything. Uh, finding myself, um, like probably LinkedIn is the best. So just if you search Daniel Lenton, I think I'm, I think I'm probably one of the top results. Um, so that's one place. And the other place in general, though, I would say is on our Discord. So... Again, maybe we can add a link in the video, but basically if you go on, to our, um, on our website and then go company and then socials, the little Discord icon, it's actually in the top right as well, sorry, in the top right of the website, click the Discord um, and you can tag me directly in the question. I'm on Discord all the time. So I'm always kind of one message away and I respond pretty quickly. So yeah, obviously happy for anybody to reach out with any questions or comments for sure. Awesome. Last question. Would you have a message for the Let's to KI community? Uh, it can be anything, something personal, something that, you really like or something that we discuss in this episode um i guess um yeah the uh, I, I guess one thing i would say i don't know i mean it, it's really it's kind of a bit like um cliched or something but i really do think it's way more important to do things that you enjoy and not worry about like prestige or anything it's something i've never really worried about and like i don't know like i, I think like you know if, if a company failed like I would have no trouble finding something else I'm passionate about and whether it succeeds or not, it wouldn't really impact how like, you know, fulfilled I am or, or something. So 
I think just basically like don't be too worried to just like follow what excites you whatever that might be because that's like what really matters in the end because <laughs> I don't know in the end not nothing really matters apart from just having a having good life <laughs> so this is kind of my my philosophy exactly. in general so yeah <laughs> who will remember uh me in a thousand years right so exactly so I should like exactly and, have fun and, the, and, and, and at some work. point at some point the sun ex- the sun explodes and you know the whole solar system goes so what matters right just just to have a have a good few years <laughs> amazing thank you very much daniel for your time we should have an amazing day likewise thanks a lot pleasure to be here